steps of my key. So let's get right into this Asbury revival. This has been a very interesting thing to watch. Let's start with the definition of revival, because I, that's something a lot of people are sort of arguing about or debating about or talking right. about. How do you see revival? To me, revival is actually outlined in scripture. It's it's very clear. There's lots of verses. God, would you not revive us again so that, that we can experience your presence and your joy? And what it is historically and biblically is it's, I think, a spiritual resuscitation, right? You're, re, you're reviving somebody who is, is dead. And so it, it although salvations happen because of it, the, the core of revival, the theme of revival is to awaken a sleeping dead church. So God, during seasons of revival, will come in and just completely overtake the event or the church service. And we know that God's everywhere, uh, but like electricity is everywhere in my building, but try sticking a fork in the plug. <laughs> now, now, now you experience it. So that's the difference. Yes, God's everywhere, but there are seasons where he will meet a, per, a, a group of people that are seeking him and praying and fasting and begin to just bring revival and people don't want to leave. The manifest presence of God is there and I'm conservative. I've got the John MacArthur study Bible. And so I, I, I don't want to get you know too out there with terms, but it is when God supernaturally does amazing things, spiritually speaking. Well, and so we're watching this happen, not just at Asbury, it's happening at Lee University. We're hearing reports of other yep. colleges, other churches where this is happening. And there's sort of two sides, like everything else, right? There's never an issue anymore where everybody's on the same page. There's nope. two sides to this. One where people are panicked and worried about over emotionalism and all these other things. Some people are super negative. And then the other side is just very, very supportive without any questions on it. Um, and, you know, people may be watching or listening right now in either of those camps. But let's Let's talk about the negative side right now. How have you reacted to seeing sort of that visceral reaction to this? Well, fortunately, I've read a lot on revivals from the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, Welsh, Scotland, America, Europe, uh, even China, the underground church in China. And so there, there is a skepticism sometimes when you see false fire or uh, what emotionalism is. People are emotionally, even the new age movement feels love and all these emotions, but emotionalism is when emotions are leading. Genuine revival is when God is leading and you feel the power and presence of God. So of course, emotions are going to follow. So anytime in a, in a revival, whether it was, um, you know, in America or Scotland, it's the same type of, of, uh, concerns. And that would be, how do you steward this environment? You know, what you can't just say, Hey man, if it's odd, it's God, just do whatever. Just let whoever come to the microphone, just let whatever happen. You can't do that, but then you can't be, you know, no, don't, don't be at the altar more than 30 minutes, you know? And I just heard one guy on a video critiquing, man, they sang this song over for 15 minutes. Well, yeah, if you're worshiping God and you're broken at the altar and God's moving, you might go past your standard four minutes. <laughs> I'm just saying. It might break so, out of the mold. Yeah, it may not you be might what break you out of the mold. So that's the challenge is finding that balance. But the concerns then would be, you know, who's coming there? Who's stewarding that environment? What are they allowing? What are they rebuking? What are they welcoming? Um, and anytime God is moving, so is Satan. And, and so anytime li uh, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said living children need rules. That's why 1 Corinthians was written, living, chilled, living, vibrant church on passion for God. You're going to see young adults saying things they maybe shouldn't say, uh, maybe doing things, maybe dancing too much that, that con makes conservatives nervous. I mean, so <laughs> that's the downside, too, would be if you don't have a, th a strong theological backing, if you're not preaching the word now and then and you're not calling people to repentance. Um, you know, that, that could be, a, I think a danger as well too. So I, I got to hand it to him. I, I, that would be a very difficult atmosphere to steward because now you've got, um, Tucker Carlson talking about it. Now you've got major news outlets picking it up. Now you've got superstar Christian rock stars that want to go there and, you know, but it's a lot of outside it. forces. It's a lot of outside forces. It, it, it was already chaotic before that. Right. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people are saying, oh, well, they did this or this speaker was associated with this other person or endorsed right. their book three years ago. And, you know, and it's concerning. And so I think it is important to be discerning as Christians. Yeah. Right. Like we should not just blindly follow anything um, at the same time. You know, I, what, what do you believe could come out of this? Like, even with those messy elements, what do you believe could be the end result of this sort of thing? 
Well, the, the irony is a lot of the negative things I've been following, people are like, well, it's going to take a while to see the fruit. You know, we'll know in a few years from now. Actually, you can see immediate a fruit. If somebody comes in addicted to porn, demonic strongholds, and they're set free and they're released and they're joy, filled with joy, and now they're going home, they're set free. That's immediate fruit. And you see the thousands of people lining up and going, the hunger for God, the desire for God. So within that, though, you're going to find, okay, I don't agree with this. This is not really biblical. But in that, you see a huge desire going forward uh, for this movement. And you will see, though, those who have never experienced revival and a passionate, deep encounter with God, they're going to mock it because they feel threatened. Like, well, I, I'm, they're not more spiritual than me. Really, this isn't about spirituality. It's about desperation. We're hungry, we're hungry and we're seeking after the heart of God. Like, so I don't know if that answers your question. But Yeah, no, I mean, it does. Really I, so you, you would see this as a pastor, as a positive overall development. <laughs> if you can get that many people coming and worshiping God and, 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 and uh, again, I'm not there. I have actually no desire to go there. Because I believe God has called me here to California, Los Angeles County. And we actually, what they're experiencing, we've had seasons of that. We've met for two weeks straight every night, not 24-7. I mean, you need staff and security and, and worship leaders and all kinds of things. But we, what they're experiencing, we felt that. We've had, we felt the power and presence of that. We've, there's churches all over the United States. I'll be in a conference call next week with who are experiencing a lot of this, just not 24-7. That's incredible. So yeah, anytime you get that many young adults, I mean, would they, would you rather they watch the Grammys and Sam Smith or go to <laughs> no. this? The answer to that you know, is no. Yeah. Right. So go to this. So that's, but I understand people, you know, they've seen weird things at other events that I don't want to necessarily name right now. Um, but, and so there's caution, there's discernment. But I think if you look at the, the, the songs and the music and the hunger, the desire, the altar, the weeping that the, they, they don't, they don't want to leave the power and presence of God. I think it within evil within evil that might be trying to stop it there's a lot of good things happening so i would love to see that at a lot of churches uh, throughout the united states bible believing christ centered churches yeah well and it's it's interesting too it's coming at a time when culture is so chaotic and every time you and i talk we talk about how chaotic culture is and it gets weirder and stranger and more difficult as time goes on and the next time you and i talk we're living in a different world than we were two months before during our yes, last conversation true. and true. you know when i look at this though i think wow Really interesting timing for this to be unfolding, especially for believers who look ahead and they think, you know, culture is going to get worse. Things are going to get crazier. So what do you make of that, that these sorts of events do percolate and happen even as culture seems to be falling apart? Well, I was just reading on the First Great Awakening, too, uh, looking at Jonathan Edwards' journals, and he said, the religious low has never been greater. The drunkenness is abounding. America seems to be an atheist-type nation rejecting God. It's never been darker in America's history. They're writing this in the late 1700s. And then God brings revival. Same thing in Welsh, New Hebrides revivals, the darkness, the depravity, the drunkenness, the three out of 10, I think, of families broke. And so during these dark times, if people are calling on God and seeking him with all their heart, with all their strength, they're praying, they're fasting, God will deliver on his promise to bring a season of revival. It might be personally, it might be corporately, it might be, you know, to an area like this. And why not the universities retake back uh, theology, the right theology, retake back the the educational system, the young adults, plus they don't have kids, they don't have jobs, they can they can come to 12 hour worship services, you know, so <laughs> God's very practical as well. Because I watch that, I'm like, th those two weeks of services every night, you know, maybe three hour services, I we, laundry was backed up. I was I couldn't get to our bills. And it was just I mean, I can't even imagine that. But that's why God chose uh, these types of, of spots. What would you say to those who are watching this and they're skeptical and they're trying, they're confused, they're trying to figure out what to make of it and they're not quite sure what side to land on? Well, I'm going to tell you this. This is a, a, a fact. 75%, 75% of the division going on is really between cessationists and continuationists. And you'll see it. it without nine out of 10 times, those who do not believe that the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit are still valid today, that group is questioning this. Um, and they, and rightly so, in some regards, you want to use discernment, you want to use wisdom. So the other 25%, they've got valid concerns, but that's really where this is. This group also doesn't talk about fasting. They don't talk about uh, all night prayer meetings. They don't talk, talk about time on the altar. And this 
too deep, you know, or deeper spiritual life is not really there. It's all about doctrine, the father, the son, the Holy word, you know, it's, it's doctrine, 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 where this group can, the other side can get a little carried away and, and, and they need that doctrine to come in. So, um, the division is happening, I think, largely because of that, because they're not, they're not open to God doing something that might be a little bit uncomfortable. And so they really have to take it to the Lord in prayer. And I, and I would repent of a hard, callous heart. Um, and and you, you see some of the greatest theologians, I mean, Whitfield, uh, Jonathan Edwards, you know, his famous sermon, Sinner, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And you see Hal Harris, Griffin Jones, Daniel Rollins in the Welsh revivals, solid theological men still experiencing revival because they were open to it. See, that's the key. You can be open and cautious or you can be cautious and critical and arrogant, and then you'll never see revival because revival is birthed in the womb of humility and brokenness. So if you, if you lack those things and you're, you're, just, you're just critical from the get-go, you will never experience a, a mighty move of God in your own heart. Well, and I think you raised a bigger issue that you and I do need to talk about on a separate conversation because it's, it's right. important. It's this sort of discussion about gifts, about gifts of the spirit, about you know, fasting, going through all these different, you know, the more spiritual elements that a lot of churches don't want to speak about that goes into right. deliverance. It goes into the, the realm of evil and understanding how that operates. You know, this is a big, obviously, major debate in the church today and one that we've got to analyze and talk about. It's essential and very important for us to have a position right. on it and to understand it. And so it's interesting, though, that you framed it that way, because that does make sense right this would be an example of the, of I, falling in I, that I'm, category nine out of ten i'm seeing lots of uh, lots of positive things but all the criticism all the criticism for the most part again there's exceptions is from the uh sensation cessationist view that the gifts and the power of, of these miraculous gifts have ceased we don't talk about revival we don't want to get too out there three hour worship service i mean when we had we had one tonight where just the whole altar was full people were backed up and people are like, that's a little bit too emotional. No, that guy's being delivered from crystal myth. That guy's repairing his marriage. That prodigal son's coming home. How dare you judge these people? And so I just deal with it all the time. I see the negative Nellies and the judgmental Jerry's, and they're just critical of God moving outside of their predetermined box. And it's it's kind of sad, really. Yeah, no, it, it is. And I think I think that we have to be open. And you read scripture and you see these incredible things happening throughout the assumption that they've all and I'm not look, I don't even have to take a position on Asbury. I can just say in general, yeah. if my position in life is that nothing amazing or that I can't explain could ever happen. Well, then I think I'd have to dismiss most of Scripture. <laughs> right. Oh, for and sure. For so sure. You, you've got to look at things, I think, for what they are and understand that that God operates in ways that are far beyond. And look, the, again, whole other conversation here, but. Our mere existence, the fact that we're sitting here communicating and talking with bodies that function like insane computers on an earth oh, yeah. that has uh -huh. trees and flowers and plants, and it that's all insane too, but we, we're used to it, so we pretend it's yeah. not. True. <laughs> and, you know, the um, here's a question I, I propose to people too. I know we don't have a lot of time, but would you, would you have felt comfortable in the upper room with the 120 when the Holy Spirit came upon them? Most people in this group would not feel comfortable. They would be they would be telling the disciples that's not biblical. So see, it has to do with these. The, I, I believe that the miraculous filling, unction, anointing of the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it. And then the other criticism is they're not preaching the gospel. Number one, how do you know? But let's let's just say let's just say for the whole day they don't preach the gospel. That that would be a kind of a biggie for me. I mean, you got all these people coming in. I would love. To, but when God is there, God is the gospel. God is convicting. God is drawing. You, you don't have to. There's been revivals where people, they'll fill it outside the chapel. In the Welsh revivals, people would be in the prairies. They would be on the roads singing hymns and being convicted and fall down and begin crying out to God. No gospel was preached. And I'm not against, I'm a preacher. That's what I do. But when God is moving profoundly and powerfully, uh, let him preach the gospel and he's convicting, he's drawing again, not an excuse not to do it. I think we should do it. I think they should be getting up there uh, to some degree and painting this picture, this wonderful picture of what the Bible paints. But we also have to be very careful not to judge it too, too quickly. So my stance is, I don't know. I'm waiting like most people. Wisdom is justified by her children. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. So far, a lot of things look really good. There are some things that, you know, I've got some concerns about, but I've got concerns about every church, even my church. I mean, no church is perfect. 
Uh, so we just have to make sure our heart is right. That's the key, if our heart is right. Well, that is a great place for us to close. Pastor Shane Eidelman, appreciate your time today. Appreciate yours too, Billy. Have a great day.